obviously, we all know Zach Johnson's game, and Mike's uh, been his coach ever since he turned turned professional. So it's quite an accomplishment, you know, to coach somebody that has two major championships, and will obviously probably be a future Ryder Cup captain someday. I actually saw Mike coach him at the Ryder Cup in 2012 at the Atlanta on the Buddy Green. He didn't really know me then, but I was watching him practice their buddy. But I can't thank him enough for coming across the country to come and speak at our section, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bender.
that's just common knowledge or that, you know, well, first of all, let me back up. <clears throat> How many people can do that? If we go to a tour event and we're on the tee, right, and Mickelson's hitting balls here or maybe McElroy, and we walk up to him and we say, uh, we'll give you 10 shots. Uh, uh, Rory, every time you hit a seven air dead straight, your normal distance, we'll give you $1,000. And every time you hit a ball that curves one way or another, you have to pay us. Do they can take the bet? Yeah. You know, so, so the amateurs, one of their concepts, and very common concepts, they're trying to get straight. A tour player can't even do it. So it's really important, and as simple as it is to us, I mean, they, they need to understand that they, they should be trying to curve the ball. That's their goal, and, and their golf swing, and the things that we work on in their golf swing should be to, to produce a show, particular shot. And like Hank was talking about, you know, either, you're either moving right to left or left to right. So I think it's really important that they understand that's what they're trying to do. But not many people do that. Not many people know that. <clears throat> so I think that's one thing. I think one of the other misconceptions they have is, and this is probably going to be kind of a little bit of a debate, and I know Greg later is going to talk about power and speed and so forth. But if you ask the average amateur, where does distance come from? Well, you're going to get a lot of answers, okay? a lot of different answers. But most of it's going to be centered around shifting your weight, using the big muscles, using your shoulders. Some people will talk about arms and wrists, not very many, but they're mostly going to be thinking those in those types of terms. So one of the things I'm going to show you, I'm going to start out with this video right here, and hopefully you can see this with the light and everything. But what it is, is I'm sitting on a chair in my bay here, and that chair rotates, okay? So you can see that my feet are off the ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this ball and try to hit it as hard as I can. <clears throat> okay, so that was me swimming as hard as I can. I go over to the track, and it's 66 miles an hour. Okay? So now I got on a chair. This chair does not spin. Okay, so it went up six miles an hour. Next one was on the knees here. Eighty-five. Okay, now the next one which you're gonna see is what I did is I stood up and I made a swing as hard as I could and tried to keep my body as quiet as I could, swing as hard as I could with my arms. Now same same amount of force in all of these swings. So take a look at this one. The old man swing. So that's a six iron, 91 miles an hour. Okay. So now I made a normal swing. This one I tried to hit it as hard as I could. I tried to swing as hard as I could, use my body, use my hips as much as I could. And here's what happened. About one mile an hour more. Okay, so I'm going to propose this question to all of us. What was taking place for the speed to go up and up and up in each situation? Anybody have any thoughts? Stability, the ground. So if you look, if we go back really quickly, and let me kind of split the screen here. I'll just take a couple swings. Watch, watch the angle of the shaft here. <clears throat> okay, so, I mean, if you look at all the swings, the angles coming down were pretty much the same as far as the, how it's relative to my body. So the answer to me is the, is the resistance to the ground or the resistance got greater, right? So when you push your foot in a block, uh, like a, like you see in a, you know in a, a track meet or whatever, a 50 or 100 yard dash, you know why do they do that? Because they get a faster start, right? Because if you push off of something that's that's solid, you're going to get a faster start than if you didn't have that. And so when it comes to amateur golfers, I mean to me, what what I did there is I was using the same amount of force with my arms, but again, the speed got greater and greater and greater because of the, the resistance to the ground. Okay, so I'm swinging a six iron there. I'm 62 years old. That's 92 miles an hour. 
I don't think that I'm not strong or whatever, but I mean, that's, that's within kind of the bottom, maybe the bottom range or two or average, but it's certainly up there for senior tour guys or whatever. Okay. So, so one of the things that I, you know, I, I show that because I want people to understand that, you know, you get a lot of speed out of those arms and hands. And um, there was a question today about coming over the top, which I'll get into later, but Chichi Rodriguez did a great demonstration one time. He said, look how easy this swings. Now watch what happens, all I'm going to do is tense up my forearm. Okay, so I put tension in my forearms. That doesn't swing anymore, so now i got to start moving my body. And I think most of our golfers, most of our amateur golfers, have so much tension in their forearms that the forearms become linked with the body, right? Because if I do this, I'm very relaxed, I can swing. As soon as I tense up my forearms, now, now I become more mechanical, right? My body has to make my arms and hands move. So I think tension levels in the golf swing are huge uh, when it comes to creating some speed, and I'll kind of come back to that in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so, so anyway, having the right concepts. For me, if you think if the people that you're teaching have the right concepts and have an idea of what it is you're trying to get them to do, then you're going to have a better chance uh, of them, to me, of them practicing, putting in the time, and improving. And part of that is I, I say that I tell them, you know, every shot has three aspects. The start line, the curve, and the contact. Okay, so if we're going to curve that ball, that start line is really, really important. How many times have you, and this drives me crazy, I'll come in with my juniors or the even tournament golfers or regular golfers say, you know, they come from us and they go, how are you hitting it? I'm hitting it terrible. I'm not hitting it very good, I'm inconsistent. And so it doesn't really say, when they say that, it doesn't tell you anything about those three aspects. You know, in other words, you know, how is your start line? You know, so if you start training, if you start training your students to think in terms of start line, curve, and contact, when they talk to you and say, how are you doing? They go, well, my start line is really good, but I'm leaving everything to the right. Well, now that tells you something. And it's kind of like what Hank was talking about, you know, over his radio show. I thought how he was determining what that player was doing, whether it was a face angle problem or a pack. You know, so you can start to determine some of these things by asking them and their response. And, um, you know, because as opposed to just saying, you know, they're not hitting it well. <clears throat> so I try to, you know, I try to train, you know, train them to think in that terms uh, instead of broad base. So what I, what I also think is important here is how they practice, right? So I know we all give good lessons and everything, but if we're going to practice curve and contact, you know, it's important to understand the target line, you know, and then have something out in front. And, uh, and this isn't anything new. I'm sure a lot of you do this. If you, you know, if I had show, show of hands, how many people put a rod out in front right on the target line? Okay, so again, most half of you maybe. If you've never done this, you, you really ought to teach people how to do this because it's so easy to do, especially with alignment rods. If you just stick an alignment rod in a shaft and walk out in front of about 10 or 15, you know, maybe about five or six yards or even a little bit more, it doesn't really matter, but you get on that line. When people stand over here and they get ready to hit, I mean, that, that to me, that orange noodle looks like it's just to the right of that black flag out there. And, and it's actually right at the green one. And so, so you can start to help their swing visually. Because visually, they look up and they can see that this is the window that they're trying to hit out. we got to get every ball starting in the right zone. Because it's about eliminating, eliminating variables, right? If I get somebody to start the ball, you know, off to the right every time, then I've only got two variables left. I've got the curve and the contact. Okay, so being able to set this up is, is a really critical thing, in my opinion, and um, it's really a funny story. Lee Jansen came to me one year, and here's a two-time U.S. Open winner, right? And he came to me and he said, uh, you know, I was a little intimidated, quite frankly. You know, here's a guy that's had success and won a lot of tournaments, majors, and so forth. And I said, well, Lee, I said, what, what's your problem? What's the ball doing? He goes, I, I hook it too much. I miss it up too much. So I said, okay, so what I did is I set this up, got it lined up good, I set up a rod in front of him. There was a green out there about a five iron distance. And I said, Lee, if I have, if I give you 10 shots, how many out of 10 do you think you can hit around that shaft and lay it on that green out there? And, and also keep it just a little bit to the right of that flag that's on the green. 
And he looks right at me without, without hesitation, he goes, 10. And I go, you want about $1,000? And he looks at me, he goes, you got 1000 <laughs> I, I never had anybody that confident before. Right? And so I kind of, you know, uh, 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 yeah, okay. So he does it, and uh, he gets seven out of ten in there. And he goes, double or nothing. And I said, well, you know, I, now I'm cocky, right? Because I got his money, right? So I said, well, what makes you think you can do do it now? And you just did seven out of ten. And he goes, because now I know how to do it. I said, okay, let's see you do it again. So he gets it, he does it again, he gets nine out of ten. He's really pissed. <laughs> he still owes me the money, too, by the way. <laughs> but I said to him, I said, to me, I said, if, if you practice, do you ever practice this way? He goes, no. I go, if you practice like this, and especially as far out to the right as that thing looks, I said, do you think you can ever miss a left? He goes, if I start to write that, I'll never miss a left. You know, so, you know, so it was, Right away, we had a pretty good lesson without even telling anything about it was awesome. Just on how to practice better, more efficiently. <clears throat> and then one other quick story about that is, is, is the only tour player that ever interviewed me was Jonathan Bird. You know, and Jonathan Bird said, Mike, I'd like you to come up to Sea Island and uh, I'd like you to you know, spend the day with me because I'm looking for a new coach. So I said, great. So I got up there, we went to breakfast, and we're talking about, you know, I was asking him about his game and everything, and I said, Jonathan, if, and if you had a seven iron in the middle of the fairway, and the pin's in the middle of the green and there's no wind, what kind of shot would you hit? And he looks at me and goes, that's my hardest shot. And I go, really, why, why would that be so hard? He said, well, I could play a draw, I could fade it, I could hit it low. And I go, well, that's partly a problem, your menu's too big. I said, let's do this. I said, let's go out on the golf course today. We're going to play nine holes. I said, if you had to hit one for your life, what would it be? He said, it would be a draw. I said, okay, let's go. We're going to play a draw. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick what's called a left line so your ball can't go left with that. And I want you to hit a draw on every single shot. So we went out, played, and he shot two or three under. <clears throat> and when we got that, he says, and we talked about not crossing that left line. And he said, I only crossed my line three times that night. Well, pretty good, wasn't it? And I said, well, in 1986, Jack Nicholas was at the Masters, and one of the, one of the media people saw him in the parking lot, and they said, Jack, what's your, you know, what's your goal for the week? So, you know, when you ask somebody what their goal for the week is, they probably do think I want to win or I want to shoot a search score. Nicholas says, I don't want to cross my line. And the guy, the guy like stopped in his tracks and tell the story and he runs over, what does that mean? He said, well, if I'm hitting the draw, I don't want the draw to cross over this line. If I'm hitting the fade, I want it to stay over here. I don't want to run across my line. So he ends up winning in 86. We all know that. A great win, right? So the, the reporter got a hold of him and said, Jack, did, did you accomplish your goal? And Nicholas said, I crossed my line three times in 72 holes. So when I told Jonathan Bird that, he's just kind of, he you know, kind of dropped his head and he goes, I guess that wasn't very good. Then, wasn't it? Okay. <clears throat> so the idea is, is, you know, to create a shot shape and, and that, if you can do that, then you're consistent, right? <clears throat> There's a question back here. Man? Yeah. yeah. So obviously, let's say that you're, you're moving toward the left line and the trouble is left. Obviously, it's beneficial to not miss the left of the left line. But if you're moving it away from the trouble, well, I think whatever shot, that's kind of a course management issue, right? And how much confidence you would have in that shot. And, and you as an instructor teaching your players either to play away from trouble or to play, you know, in this case, to be moving at it. But the key is, is if you can keep from crossing your line, like I tell people, if they're playing, if they're a right to left player, you know, I don't mind, everybody misses it. You're going to miss all shots, but I, I'd much rather miss right than not. Does anybody, if you thought about that, why would you think that way? What, who's on the defense more? If I, if I miss left, am I more on the defense or more on the offense when I play off? Um, I'm worried about left, so I'm going to probably miss right too. If I miss right, then i got to be more offensively with my swing to make it draw. So I think a right miss is much better miss than, than a left. <clears throat> so. So anyway, I mean, if I hit a shot here, 
Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out here, and this is something that we have at our range, and hopefully I'll, I'll show you a slide here in a minute of it. But I asked Jonathan and Zach one time, I said, hey guys, how many times in a year do you hit the pin? And they looked at me and they go, I don't know, three or four? I said, do you ever get any better at it? And they go, no, I mean, it's not like you get better at it, right? So I said, if you hit a, if you hit a wedge and you're on the fairway, What's the farthest from the pin that you would think is a good shot? What do you think they said? So they got a wedge or a nine iron, they're hitting a full shot into the green. What do you think that, that they said would be a good shot? That's kind of what I thought they would say. I thought they'd say 10 feet or in. They both said 15 feet. I thought that was interesting. So, so I said, okay, well, if that's a nine iron or a wedge, how about a seven or an eight? They said, well, if we hit it 20 feet or in or closer, it's a good shot. And then I said, okay, six and five, would you go 25? They go, yeah. I said, what about a hybrid or a long iron? They go, well, we're usually hitting those in the par threes or par fives, so it'd probably be 35 feet or closer. So what I did is I created some zones. <clears throat> now take a look at that orange flag that's to the right of the green pole out there. Can you see that? If you had to guess just looking at that in yards, how many yards does that look like? Somebody said 13. Okay, it looks like a lot, right? I mean, it, would you believe it's uh, it's uh, just under seven, right? It's 20 feet. That's what 20 feet looks like. But if you hit a shot over there, I mean, a pro hits it over there, they probably think that's not that good. <clears throat> okay. So what we did is we came up with some zones, and we came up with a you know a nine iron red zone. And on my academy, what I have is a target in the middle of the range, and then I have these colored poles to the right and to the left, so whether you're hitting draws or fades. And the goal is to see how many out of 10 you can hit into the, into the zone. Okay, and I've got, I've got some, some things I'm going to hand out here in a minute. But if I'm setting up here, hitting a shot, How did they do on that? You guys can't really see it, but how, how was it? Okay. All right, your turn. Go okay. ahead. So the thing I like about this is it forces the players to watch the ball too. And at driving ranges, people hit it and the ball's going and they're already raking over another ball, right? But if I put out groups of 10, 10 balls, yeah, they're gonna see how many out of 10 they can get in there. Now it becomes kind of a game. And this, this skill transfers to the golf course. Okay, you, we all know that golf is the only sport that is not practiced on the field it's played on. Right, so pretty amazing, right? So, you know, on, on our tee box, we got a big patch of rough. And we have an uneven lie station where we can hit to our zones off uneven lies and we can get out of the rough. We need to, we need to think in terms of building practice facilities that transfer the skills to the golf course. And it also opens up teaching opportunities for you so that you don't necessarily have to go on the golf course in a playing lesson to teach somebody how to hit a ball out of rough. What's rough going to do? What's wet rough going to do? You know, what's this lie going to do versus that lie out of the rough? So I'm just throwing it out there because it's something that you can do that's pretty simple that would actually help your, uh, you know, help your practice facilities. <clears throat> Okay, let me show you this next slide here. Why do you think you would say that? Can you read it? No. no. It says, it's, this is a, it's, it's a thing by Hogan, it says, to be an accomplished fader of the golf ball, one must first know how to draw. <laughs> interesting, isn't it? Because it's interesting that Hank kind of touched on that too, didn't he? So what, why why do you think Ben Hogan said that? Huh? They did it from the, so to hit a draw, you got to have a pretty good golf swing. I think. Uh, not necessarily. I'm talking about. I, I would throw one condition in there with normal alignment. I mean, if I aim to the to the right and I come smother and hook it, that isn't really isn't a draw. But a ball that starts out right and draws. So I kind of get a bad rap a lot of times in, in the industry is, is they go up bend or he teaches everybody to hook it. 
And I really don't. I, I, I like to make the ball. I like the first, whatever the person wants to do, whether they want to fade the ball or draw the ball. That's fine with me, but I want them to hit it on time. And so that's the difference. So most people, if you had 100 golf lessons, you guys, if we gave 100 lessons, uh, well, actually, I'll back that up. Out of 100 people, how many people can start a ball out to the right and draw it back? What percent? Not very many. Would you agree? Okay. Huh? Yeah, they probably weren't trying to. So now it goes back to the original discussion about consistency and distance. You know, everybody wants consistency and distance, but they can't hit. They can't hit a ball that starts out right and draw it back. Why? Why is that? Okay, but it, I think it goes. I think that's the simple answer: path, face, right, the ratios, and things like that. But why can't they create these angles? So what I want to try to do here in the next couple minutes is try to give you some ideas. We all battle. That's just, we, we all battle people who slice and don't, you know, don't get distance and things. So I'm going to show you some things that you can do that will really speed that process up. And then we've had some some good success with. So, so I'm thinking, um, you know, basically, to me, it, what makes sense is it's a domino effect. Okay, and the first domino I think is alignment, and it's basically that is. Now I'll go to that 100 people again. We do another 100 people, and you, you've got them out here, and you say, okay, you don't put any alignment rods down, and you just say, okay, I want you to aim at that green flag out there. What percent out of the 100 is going to aim properly? Would, would anybody say a lot? Not very many. But how many of us teach aiming? All of us. There's not one person in here that doesn't teach aim. So there's got to be a problem. If we're teaching people how to aim and they don't aim very good, then either they're not listening or the way we the way we teach it doesn't work. Okay, so I don't think the way we teach it works very good. So, and I'm not saying that from a you know, I'm just saying that based on the results of how many people aim poorly, right? And one thing I think you all should do, and just as a, as an idea, is that when you come up, maybe you've had a long time student, maybe he's, you know buys a series of lessons or a long time student. What I would do is before you, you know, when you hit, when you're watching them hit, have them hit to a target without any alignment sticks or anything. So that the first thing you're always looking at is how good is their aim. Because if we're trying to get consistent and we aim poorly, we've got to make a compensating swing to hit a good shot, right? And one of the things, I'm out on the tour quite a bit, like with Zach and like players and stuff, and the one thing they always want me to do is stand behind them when I go out on the course. They're always, they're always working on aim. I don't know anybody out on the PGA Tour that really aims poorly, right? And they're always working on it, and they're always using rods and sticks. But one of the most common ways that we teach aim is for people to pick a spot in front of the ball. You know, that's been, you know, I mean, Nicholas, I don't know if he's the one that started that or whatever, but, you know, people are supposed to come in and they're supposed to line the face up, and then they look at that spot and they look out there. And so I would say when I ask people, how do you aim, that's the number one thing they tell them. And then I look and I point and I show them where they're aiming and they're, and they're always to the right. They're always aiming to the right almost all the time. Unless you have somebody who's like a big slicer and they've learned how to compensate for that. Okay? So this is something practical you can do with your students. And I know you've seen this in seminars and stuff. Some of you might not have. But and I know we've got a close group here. But have you ever showed them where you, where you hold the right arm out and the left arm? Have you ever done that before? So if you just take your right hand and maybe uh, let's point it at the green flag there, and then take your left hand and put it parallel like this and look down there and tell me how many yards it looks like. So look at this is parallel, everybody. Not or th this is not parallel. This is parallel, right? So try that. Just point your right hand at one of the flags. Point your left hand. Put it about this far apart, and, and tell me in yards how far to the right or left. I mean, eighty yards. I heard people say 150. <laughs> so it's crazy, right? But if you put a laser on this arm, right? We put a laser down this arm, laser on this arm, and we got out there to the green flag, they'd only be that far apart with the laser being from But your eyes don't work that way. So here we got people standing on the side of the ball, 
And what they do is they come in here, and the first thing they do is look for the target. So what they do is they instinctively they do a really good job of getting their body to aim at the target. Because they're just like sighting the gun. If I'm right here, I can see where it's aimed. But if I hold it out here, that's pretty hard. So what they do is they're looking at the target, and invariably they aim right. Okay. And so one of the things that you can do to help them with that, I, I love this thing because it, it, it shows them how far left it really should look like if they're square. So what we do is we'll pick a target out on the left side of the range. We won't have any alignment rods. I'll have them go in there. I'll have them take their setup. And when they're ready, I'll just have them put the club right behind their heels like this. And then we'll back up. And then we'll draw an imaginary line right through the ball parallel to that. And that's where they're aiming. And usually they're not aimed very good. So then we say, okay, let's make an adjustment now. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to go over to the right side of the range. And this time I want you to, I want you to try to, if you were aiming right, I want you to aim way more left. And so they keep doing that. So we do like three or four different targets until they start to get on it or a little left of it. I don't mind if they're a little open. But if they get to the right, I don't, I don't like that. Because then I think they start to make, starts to fuel the fire or using their body more shoulders come over the top. So get them to practice aiming. It only takes four or five minutes to practice three or four different targets around the range. Because putting clubs on the ground and, and rocks does not make you aim better on the course. So if I get used to hitting with this, this is great because I know I'm lined up while on the range, but when I go play, I'm aiming at a different target for different angles. So it really doesn't help me aim better that much. Okay? <laughs> And usually what I try to get people to do, and this is how I tell them to do it on the course, is once they start to get lined up where it's pretty good, I say, how far left do you feel like you are? And they'll say, 40 yards or 80 yards or whatever. And I'll say, okay, I want you to pick an object that far left. When you go play, pick it something out there that far left. And when you set up to the ball, you know, look at your feet and get it pointed at that object and then, then bring your up head a uh, rise back to the target. And typically when they do that, they start aiming a lot better. And if they're, you know, if they're people who usually are over the top and everything, if, you're home, if they're way more left than normal and they come over the top, you know, now they're really going to get a bad shot, right? So they, they automatically start feeling that they can't make that move as much. So I think alignment is so basic, but it's, it's undervalued and kind of, in my, in my opinion, a little bit under top because of how many people have trouble with it. They struggle with it all the time. Okay, and remember what our goal is. Get more consistency and more distance. So that'd be kind of like the first, kind of first domino here. I'll just refer to my notes just because I kind of want to go in an order here, so. All right, Pat. I asked Pat earlier if he'd volunteer, so come on up here. All right, so let's say you have a, uh, you know, you, you have a new student, or it could be somebody you've worked with before, and probably not somebody that's maybe newer, higher, anything, whatever. But, um, but after, after you have that alignment discussion with them, okay, so that, let's say they're lining up now, here's what I want you to do. I know you're not loose, but I want you to set up to this bag right here. Put your uh, club right like that's the middle bag, and I want you to go ahead and make me a normal swing. This is what feels comfortable to you. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hit that a lot harder this time. Put a little bit more speed into it. Okay, see where the bag went? Okay, so let me borrow that. See, that went the other way, right? Okay, so. If you do this with your students, there's going to be about 99% of them are going to make that bag without them. Okay? And what's the number one thing that we're, you know, people pull, they slice? Okay? So come on over here for a minute. Actually, let's come out here and we're going to face the audience here. So what you're going to see, and most people, again, if they're using their body and they're, and they're, they're making this kind of move, or they're aiming right, they're making that kind of move, that bag's going to rotate the wrong way, okay? And it can open up a discussion as to why it should move the other way. But one of the things that influences um, 
how they bring the club down is how they turn. So go ahead and take the setup here. Just split your hands apart for me. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kind of move you. I'm gonna put you in kind of a more of a straight up and down position like this. Okay, you want to take your arms back a little further. Okay, so if I hold you in this position here and I hold your shoulders, where does it feel like your arms would want to go? Would they want to go kind of more this way, or would they want to go that way from here? They want to come towards me, don't they? Okay, now start over again. Okay, now I'm going to set you up here. I'm going to turn you here. Okay, now I'm going to hold your shoulders. Where do they want to go now? They want to go more that way, don't they? Okay. All right, good. I'm going to use you again in a minute. Thanks. Okay, so to me, you can only swing your hands in a direction that's consistent with the way your body is. Unless you're, unless you're, if I'm in a kind of straight up and down, reverse pivot type thing, you know, I could actually try to let my arms drop and get behind me or do some kind of manipulation to get the club to be able to rotate that to the right. But if, it, but if he turns, if he's in a good spine angle and he won't rotates around it, and that's not a big head movement or any of that type of thing, because if my hip, as my hips turn, if they stay centered, my right hip is actually going to gap away a little bit here, and I'm going to be able to maintain my spine angle without moving my head. And when I do that, now it opens up a lot of space to get my arms back in front of my body. So I think like the second, if we're talking in terms of dominoes, that second domino is, is how that body turns. And if you look at every athletic sport where something is hit or thrown, the upper part of the body is tilted away from the target, right? So, I mean, you take football players, javelin throwers, shot putters start this way, uh, tennis players, they throw the ball up their back here like this. So, you know, so I think in golf, it's important, I think, to get the body in the right position to be able to develop speed and bring the club in on the proper angle. So I think if we're trying to get people to do that, and they're coming over the top of their seat, which so many people are, and you're not looking at how the body is, you might be trying to work on something that's not going to work very well. They're going to have to try to manipulate that club a little bit. So that's just, again, something for your consideration to kind of, you know, to kind of look at there. <clears throat> Um, but I think it's, uh, I use that word influence. It influences Pat. Okay, one more time, Pat. This is a, so this is another something that's really, really eye-opening to your students and, and to you as a teacher to kind of figure out um, what, what they use to uh, start down with. But go ahead and set up again and make me your normal backswing for me. Okay, now if I did hold your shoulders here, how would you start down? Okay, so you, you had to think about it a little bit. I'm holding it really tight. If you do this to your students, you put a hand here, hand on the shoulder there, and ask them to start down, they're going to be frozen. Okay, they won't. So do that to me. If you stand here, just put your hand on my shoulder. So what they'll do, hold me really tight, because they're going to try and turn as hard as they can. And, if I, and so what I do, if I go like this, and that's kind of what you were trying to think, okay? So you can see I've got some speed there, right? But because of that tension thing I was telling you about, most people would never do that. That's not their normal move. Their normal move is to start to move their hips, start to move the shoulders, and let the arms be moved by, okay? So I'm not saying that the body's not important, and I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea about this video of me just swinging with my arms and stuff. But if you don't have an arm swing, if you don't have acceleration of the arms in the golf swing, you're never going to get it far. Because you got a quarter of one second, there's a, that somebody mentioned earlier, there's a quarter of one second to get the club from the top to the bottom. And so you've got to have that acceleration so that as the body works, now you can now it can assist and add in uh, to that acceleration. And, and, and I'm not talking about mature pros now, I'm talking about our anglers, our, our, our anglers that we're teaching every day. And how many of them use their arms and how many of them release the club well? Not very many. <clears throat> and if you see here, I told Greg not to kill me but later because he's probably got things that are going to be maybe contrary. But if you see this thing, hey, that thing's going pretty fast and I'm not putting much effort into this. So what makes this go fast is there's an acceleration forward but me pulling backward. When I pull backward, it makes the thing go forward faster. So all of this 
the ground forces and the, and the spinning and the jumping and everything. What that's doing is that's like taking this thing and pulling it backward again. That's adding the speed, right? Well, what should I just really do this? If I just go down the line. So if I come down and I don't have rotation and I just swing with all arms and everything, I can't, I can't swing it nearly as fast. So, you know, I think you have to have that burst of acceleration from the start of the announcement. You've got to be able to, it's like a motorcycle on a four-wheel drive Jeep at a red light, right? That red light turns green, who's going to win that race? But who has the most horsepower? And our bodies are strong. And <clears throat> Who asked that person that asked that question about why do everybody, why does everybody slice? Uh, that person isn't in here, maybe. Uh, that asked it this morning. Oh, there you are. Okay. So I think it's because they, when you link up both sides of your of your body, our our body's strong and it feels powerful. So the most natural thing in golf is to try to hit this thing as hard as I can. And I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to use my strength and, and hit this ball as hard as I can. As opposed to, you know, snapping a towel or cracking a whip, playing ping pong, right? When you do those types of things, it those are quick ballistic movements, right? And so I think it's a combination of that. You know, you've got to have that, and that's what I see amateurs don't have. They number one, they don't line up very good, right? They line up right. When they line up right, it's very difficult to make a good turn. If I line up right, I don't really want to hit behind the ball very good or I'm going to hit it over there. So they start turning incorrectly and getting out of position at the top. And then their transitions are this way because they got to pull the ball or what have you, or they've not learned how to use their arms very well. Okay? So, so Pat, you have to do one more. You have no chance to get the bag, right? You're like Lee Hansen, now you know how to do it. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll get him up there, take it up to the top. Okay, that's a really good turn. I'll slowly come down and let the club get to the back. There you go. You know, you're gonna do that on your own, okay? Okay, so you can go home now, you're fixed. <laughs> I know what he's thinking. He's going, man, if I did that, I'd hit big push hooks. I'd come in and hit it way to the right. And probably, Pat, maybe for you, you maybe did throw your hands to the right, right? Okay, to do that. That's possibly what you did. Which, is, which for somebody who's going the other way, that's a very good thing. Okay, because there's really three swing shapes, isn't there? There's inside, out, there's inside, square to inside, and there's out to in. And so, so many people are steep and, you know, they, they need to actually get a little bit more this way and then it's easy to bring them back. It's easy to bring them back to a more of a rounded swing and more matched up once they can do that because they get the shaft in a position of leverage. And, you know, you see that so many times when people are releasing early, right? Well, it's a byproduct. They're not trying to release early. It's a byproduct that they're sequencing. And their sequencing is a byproduct of where they are and how they're starting their next. And so what happens is you get them to, then they do this and this plug releases early and then you get them to start accelerating the hands toward the ball and get some freedom here and all of a sudden now they look like this. You know, now they, now they can have a much better impact position. So it kind of goes in that domino effect there. But being able to show that bag and, and get them to do that is eye-opening for them. And uh, what happens then, initially, too, is if they were to hit a ball doing that, I mean, the ball was, you know, you can imagine how far the right goes, because the release habit of how they release the club doesn't match up very well to that new path, right? Because all of us in golf, all of us in here have a particular release habit that's matched up to how we bring the club into the ball. And, and so if you change that, if you come along and you flatten that shaft, or if you're steep in it, whichever way you've got to go, the, the release that your hands have isn't going to work for that type of action. So you have to retrain the hands. And people go, well, I don't, I don't want to think about my hands. Do I have to think about my hands? And you know what you got to train them. They're not just going to happen automatically. You know? <laughs> so once you train them, then you won't have to think about them. Okay? So I'll show 
you a couple things that we do here. This is, this is a very expensive training aid. It's a Home Depot bucket filled with ice. And then we, we stick a shaft, we stick a club down in it, and then we, we have people stand in this position here, and then we have them rotate the wrist. And they rotate it. And then what they do is the first time they do it, they rotate it and the shaft goes like this. But they, because they're not really rotating the club head around the shaft, they're rotating the shaft and changing the face that way. So once you can get them to turn it, like this, it starts to give them a feeling for how to how to release the club head. Um, we use this thing a lot too. This is as as people start getting into a better kind of a better downswing position and everything, and they work on impact. The most important position in golf is what impact, right? And nobody ever works on it very rarely. So to me, what I'll do, and this is another thing I did with Lee Jansen when he was there at that lesson. I said, Lee, show me what impact is. Show me what impact position looks like. I wish I would have filmed it. It was the ugliest looking thing. I mean, he had no idea what impact was. You know, but, but that doesn't really surprise me because he never really worked on it. This is just something that happened for him. But but now if you ask him to do it now, he'll show you and it looks looks like it should. But, so here, what this is, is that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to come into impact and I'm trying to match the shaft at the same time the club head hits this plate. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hold that position. And I've got my right arm is relaxed and under my left, my hands are forward. And the nice part about this thing is, this little tool, is it doesn't matter what you, if you believe that the shaft should return on exactly the same line it started on, you can set it up that way. I happen to believe that the shaft raises uh, at impact, and and so it starts to get more into a vertical position. So, so that's what you know. So we set it up for that. So what I do is I have people do three or four of these, and then step right up here and hit shots, and then go right back in here, and you know just keep rehearsing it. Okay, so that they start to develop a feel for impact. Go ahead. Well, here, here's the science behind this that makes sense to me. So, okay, and, and you guys could probably educate me on some other stuff here, but when you set up, there's two angles here, right? And that's why you see Shambo and Bo Norman and guys setting up like this. But the normal golfer sets up with two angles, right? So if I lift that up, and that angle's whatever it is, and I stand on a, a spinning disc that goes, so a seven air goes, what, 80 some miles an hour? depending on your level, but if I spin at 80 miles an hour, guess what's going to happen? That thing's going to go just like this, right? So when you when you develop a lot of speed, they say a 7 iron weighs about 50 pounds when you swing it as it gets going really fast, the weight of it. So if you want to be in harmony with physics, then the handle's going to rise or should rise. But the disadvantage to that, some will say that when that happens, when the handle raises, then the hands tend to run away from you and you get excess rotation of the club head. And I would agree with that if you don't sink it up very good with your body. So, and then the people who try to get the hands lower, so I call that horizontal hinging, they try to get the butt of the club lower. They usually come in, the hands are lower, and what they do is they're able to control the face a little bit better and go around. They usually have more of a, sometimes what we call a, a more of a flip style release as they do this. They're more this way, but they hit it. They hit it straight, okay. And uh, so, I think that you can still kind of be in harmony here and still get your hands to rotate around with your with the tip of your body. Aren't they both also a little ball flight fixated? Say that. You mean? Uh, if you're trying to face it lower, draw it higher. Most likely. Yeah. So if the guys. If a guy like uh, Kucher or somebody who tends to get his hands low or whatever, he's trying to play fades, it might be more conducive to a fade. Yeah. Um, so, you know, training that release, I mean, we have a lot of other tools that I use. I'm just going to show you a couple. Sorry, Mike? Yeah. What do you think about pricing the Shambler setup and why not start that way? Well, the disadvantage, and that's a good thing, I mean, that's what Shambler does. It's a, he gets it in an impact way called impact position first, right? 
And then when he goes up to the top, his left wrist is in impact position too, like this, right? And so what he's trying to do is swing on one plane, is basically what he's doing. Now the typical, if we did that, what happens is, that's as much wrist cock as I can get. If I go like this, now I can increase the range of motion in the wrist. And if you notice, he has two swings, he calls it his power swing, a piston swing, and his, when he goes to hit it far, he doesn't do that. He's more this way. And he's good enough to be able to change it, okay? But, so being this way, and then, you know, he's very, you know, then you gotta be very upright and things like that. I mean, to me, I think you gotta be pretty strong to do that. But, interesting, because that was the same thing that, you know, Wilson Bloomberg had the, had the club down the middle of the hand this way, right? And he stood a long way away, so he could try to, try to swing it all on one, one plane and not have to change it, okay? <clears throat> yeah, if anybody has any questions as I go on, don't hesitate, okay? This is another tool we use all the time. Uh, I'll see if you guys can see this out here. So basically, you can put this up against the wall if you're indoors or if you're uh, outside on the range. It's just held down by T's. I would get too close to the uh, pen, uh, pen here. But what this this face plate has a rotation to it, and as Trackman has showed, you want you know the face should be slightly open at impact. If you're coming in, let's say you're five degrees or four degrees from the inside, you want like a two degree open face if you're hitting a, a draw. So you can kind of set this however you want. Let's try that again. So basically this thing just slides out. And then what I get players to do, they take their setup, they come into impact, and they push it into their hips, and finish. And so what I'm trying to get players to do, because once a player has a really good setup, they've got a pretty good turn, you know, they're getting, you know, what happened, they're starting to get the club down in front of them, I mean, what matters from here through the ball is everything, controlling that face. So you've got to, what I call, match up. So if I get up here, I come down to the impact, now my hips turn, I'm keeping that club in front of me, and I'm controlling that club face. So I have them do that, and then I have them hit balls, stop over here. We use this thing, this, you guys have heard of that impact snap club. Well, I took it and got with Marty, and. I put it in a golf club now, and we're starting to come out with them because they work really well. But then you can hit balls with it. So basically from here, as you come down, this thing goes against your wrist, and you're gonna try to, you, you hit balls with it, and you, you do, do a lot of these what we call hidden holes to try to get a better impact position. If you flip it, the right hand, this goes right against the right hand, and so the person can feel it really good. You can feel the because it's something solid. If, you know, they make a lot of different things that do this, but usually they're flimsy and you can't really tell if you did it right or not, okay? <clears throat> so we, we do a lot of work on, you know, impact and through the hitting area because, as we all know, the better you get at coming with your path, the better your path is and the more consistent your playing is, then you've got to control that pace. And um, I know that Shambo's coach, I don't know, I don't know personally, but one of the coaches at my place, you know, has talked about how he's just like, that's all he's concerned about is the club face. And how, you know, that's all he works on is club face control. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things that as you get better, you know, then it starts to make, that's what really makes a difference. But in, unless you've got some acceleration, unless you're coming in on a plane, you're probably not, you know, not gonna work, or not gonna matter that much if that's all you're working on. <clears throat> Another kind of interesting thing that we let's see if I have this video real quick here. So here's you got a lot of you have seen this before, but here's Hogan after he's been with Lawson. And look at his look at his right arm position. And look at 
the tilt of the shoulder. And he's kind of pumping it down. And then watch, and then he goes to swing, look at the right arm. And then he lets it out right here. And so one of the things that that I see a lot, again, in our, in our higher handicaps is they get to the top and it can be for other reasons, but a lot of, I will see a lot of this right arm moving this way, this right elbow is actually working behind them, and the right shoulder is moving more out. So I kind of came up with a screening aid that has a, uh, has a spring in the middle of it, like this. So when you take it up to the top, you try to drive that elbow in, and it starts to give people a feeling, you know, for where they start to, they start to, there's some tension there, they start to move that right arm in a better position. And so the before and after picture for this thing have been pretty remarkable because the downswing happens in a quarter of a second, right? And it's so hard, you can tell, hey, you want to try to feel like you're leading a little bit with that right elbow, you want to get your hands toward the ball, but it doesn't mean anything to anybody until they can start feeling. So with this thing here, uh, you know, they actually hit balls with it and everything, but it's, uh, it's, it's Produce some pretty good look. The shallows out the shaft. Uh, you know, the shaft is much shallower, so you start to get much more lag. And uh, anyway, it's just a good tool. So, <clears throat> yeah. Just now, yeah. <laughs> So there's a company that makes them in Oklahoma the four man. And he said, well, we're only gonna do so many for a cast. I go, man, I've sent you about 50 videos of people. I mean, that's pretty good. So anyway, they're gonna start, they have another running coming. Right out in front of them. 
And if you saw those two guys hitting balls next to each other, you wouldn't think they looked that much alike. But you see it under slow motion, and it looks pretty good. So if you take all the people in the history of the game that you can think of, or maybe the top five, shallowest swings in golf, who, who would you think of? Trevino, for sure, yeah. Trevino, Sergio, Sergio Garcia, right? I mean, he kind of he flattens it a different way a little bit. Um, Hogan was shallow. How about Bolton Norman again? Those of you that have seen Bolton Norman, I mean, he stood so far away, he couldn't help but be shallow. But you know what they all have in common? Besides being shallow, they're all great ball strikers. They're all great ball strikers. <coughs> So somewhere you know, over the history, it's shallow, that word shallow, now coming back around, and I've been teaching it for 20, 30 years, but now all of a sudden, now it's starting to become more, like they, somebody mentioned it today, right? And the, with Hank, they're talking about shallow versus deep. But when, you know, for a while there, if you were shallow, that was like the worst thing you could be. I mean, you wanted to, you wanted to you know, get the club in front of you and all this kind of thing. And, and that's true, but if my arms are in front of me and have space in here, they can, they can go right around the arc even if that shaft is nice and shallow. So I just caution you when you're looking at shallow shaft angles to check the hand path. Okay? Mike? Yes. About uh, camera angle, how disciplined or should we be with, like those two pictures there, I'd say they're maybe a little bit off. Do you generally try to exact these spots and put them on? I mean, we, we, we all do and should. Let me, let me give you an example of camera angle, because what your question is really, really good. Okay, so let me turn this. Okay, question for the group again. You come up and you're going to videotape your student, and you say, uh, Mr. Smith, hit to that green pole out there. And Mr. Smith lines up like this. How many of you are going to put the camera over there? How many of you are going to put the camera over here? We got it. I'm going to hold you to this one. Who votes for putting the camera or just leaving the camera more down that ball line? Who? How many? How many people would vote for that? One? Okay. How many vote for putting the camera over here? Oh, I only see a few. You do both. Basically, he was doing it. He was moving it over here to show how bad the alignment was. But I, I, would, I would tell you this. So I made the same swing here, and all I did, I kept the camera in the same place, and I just moved my stance. Now watch what happens here to the to this. So personally, what you to answer your question, I like the camera on the toe line. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's there's that. Watch this one here. I can get it going. Okay, what do you think about those two swings? So, so the, the one on the left, the club head is not inside. The one on the right, the club was way inside. Okay, now watch this. So halfway back is a checkpoint for me on, on how deep the hands are. So the one on the left, the hands are right on the bicep. And the one on the right, they're way behind the body. It's the same muscle. It doesn't look like it, though, does it? So now watch at the top. Look at how flat that looks. And look at the plane. Completely different. So if you're trying to look at the plane and everything, the machine iron wire, right? Probably the best thing there ever is in hitting a golf ball. But that machine has a base on it that's sitting like this, and it has the wheel right in the arm, and it goes around and hits the shot. This is perfect every time. If they wanted to hit it over to another target, guess what they got to move? They got to move the base. They got to move that whole base. And so when you see players that are, you know, I've heard it, I've heard now with track man, I, I'm not naming any names or anything, but I've heard that, that it doesn't matter where you aim. All that matters is what the numbers are in the track man. Well, when you see people that are doing this kind of stuff, you know, they're, they have chicken wings and poor weight 
transfer or different things like this. I mean, it's usually because they're aiming, they're, they're aiming somewhere else and then they got to try to get their golf ball to go to that target. So I think if you're going to film, you need to film on the toe line, which is, I think, the base of the plane. I mean, this is a this is the base of our, our iron wire machine. So I would, I would highly recommend that you come over and film the guy right on the tow line because that will show you where the plane is relative to where you're aiming. Okay? And that way you can also use it to say, look how far, by the way, we were aiming at the red flag and the red flag's behind you. should be in front of you. George. Yeah. Is 25 degrees. 
when we say we well, we we you know we'll say between 25 and 27 degrees. So that bottom rope that you see there is hanging at 24 degrees. And so what happens is, is we have our juniors and our players, and what happens is when they hit the shot, they can see where that ball is relative to that rope. And uh, so Zach's over there on the wedge range hitting. <clears throat> you can see it a little bit better there. Here's a close up. So you can see the concrete blocks out there. Our range looks pretty shabby right there. It's a little better now, but the concrete blocks like um, Sean was talking about, we have them uh, positioned or fanned out around the range from 30 to 100 yards, and the goal is to land the ball on the block. <clears throat> Because great wedge play, you have to have control over how far the ball flies, right? Because some greens, the ball backs up, some greens, the ball hits and releases. So you really need to know how far they're going. And so we can work on trajectory here. And not that, I mean, there's certain situations, obviously, that you want to hit a wedge higher. But we found at 25 degrees, you're going to get maximum spin. And so um, what I have here, is I've got some of these cars, and you're welcome to come up. I didn't have enough for everybody. I didn't know how many people were going to be here. And these are Zach Johnson's track man numbers on the wedge for the wedges for an 80 yard shot and a 110 yard shot with 54 and an 80 yard shot with 60 degree wedge. So, um, so it's interesting to take a look at this. But this spin rate is up around 10,000. Which is pretty good for those wedges to be able to control it, and be able to have enough stopping power. And uh, so, so one of the things that we do to teach this. So if you see, and obviously, if we hit down on a, on a ball this way, it's going to produce more backspin than if we hit that way, right? So if we had to hit down on a golf ball, what would you have to do? If you want to hit down on a ball, what would you need to do? Or what, what could be some variables? Play it back, so we say play it back in the stance. I think playing it back in the stance, or you could actually increase the lean, right? You could have more lean and impact. So what we try to get people to do is put it back, and, and that in turn, if the stand, if the hands are on the inside of the left side, we play the ball back, that increases, decreases loft and increases the lean of the shaft. But because there's, we're on an arc here, if this is an arc, this is the apex of the arc right here, but if I set the ball back here, now the club is going to really be coming from the inside, so to offset that, we're going to open up. So I get player to open up and aim quite a bit more left with their stance so that the club isn't so severely from the inside. And what you're going to see on these numbers right here is the, the 60 degree wedge is 10, is 10 degrees from the inside. So you've got a 10 degree number from the inside, which seems a lot, right? But if you take into consideration that's with an open stance on a track, then it's probably really more like 20, 20 degrees from the inside. And so what he's trying to do, and what, what we've worked on over the years, is he's trying to hit a low draw. Okay, and if you think about it, when I first told Zach that he needed to hit a low draw with his wedges, he goes, what are you, on drugs? He goes, why would I want to hit a low, why would I want to draw a wedge? And I said, if you think about it, most greens are sloped from back to front. So if the pin's here and the ball lands to the right of the pin and it starts to spin left, it always has a chance of going in the hole. If the ball, that's the number one. Number two, if the ball lands right in the hole, you're going to have a right to left putt. And I said, uh, three, when you're out there in the fairway and you're trying to make the ball do something, you're on the offense. If you're trying to hit it straight, what you're really saying is I don't want it to go right or left, right? So it's a more of a defensive shot. And then the fourth thing, which people raise their eyebrows about, is it draws and stop faster than fades and spin more. Now, most people would disagree with that, but if you're hitting a fade, typically the ball launches much higher and the ball is a lot softer. I mean, it does stop, fades do stop, but it's not, it's not because they're spinning more, it's mostly because they're soft. <clears throat> yeah. How big is the Four feet by four feet. If you're thinking about doing this, the well, one thing you want to make sure that you do is put them in the upslope so, so wherever you are you can see them, right? And if you don't have upslopes, then you just bury them down so it's something at you. Okay, in the back there. Thank you. How far away from Put a 
know, the, this pole is not that far from them. And here's how you, here is how you do it. This is how you figure it out. This is pretty funny. Watch, watch him hit this shot. This is an 80 yard shot. Here's the block he's trying to hit right here. Watch this shot. He's calling the horses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that like, take that. Okay. Well, all right. So watch it from the front view here. So it, you know, we all have usually have ways we can draw things. So I put a, I just put a line on the ball, right? And then what happens is if you want to monitor launch angle without a track man or anything like that, when he hits the ball, all you got to do is take the ball, draw the line from that through the golf ball, and they'll tell you that was 26 degrees. Now off of a mat, the ball typically launches a little bit higher off of a mat than it does off the ground. Okay. But so what I did is I got on this mat here and I took a video. I walked out about, so like if you were going to do it right here, I'd take a video from here, get a video camera, and I'd, and I'd uh, draw a line at 24 degrees and I'd go out I, I, and I'd put, I'd put a pole in the ground like that and then I just, and then I just measured it on, on the uh, on my video camera. And once I got it, I just I buried it in the ground and got the same on the other side. So that's how I did it. I mean, those holes, by the way, you could make it so they could come in and out, right? You could put a sleeve in the ground and just pull it out, and then when you want to use them, put the poles in. Okay? Okay, so, so getting back to that, the spin again. Here's the problem when you tell an amateur, hey, we want to hit these lower, we're going to put that ball back is what's going to happen is, is because they put the ball back, they're going to start taking monstrous divots, right? The more divot you take, the more under the ground this is, and the ball launches off the middle of the club face, and you're going to have less spin. You want as least amount of metal on the ball as possible. So the more you can hit it towards the bottom two grooves, the more spin you're going to put on the ball. Okay, so like if you hold on to a quarter, and just with the tip of your fingers, and you slam down on a uh, on a countertop, it'll shoot out and zip right back. But if you hold the quarter in the middle and you do it, it'll just bounce around. So what we need to do is we need to be, we need to get that, the walk off that thing, but we want to take really, really shallow divots. And so when I have people making swings, they'll want to, I tell them, I want you to brush that grass, you know, give it a haircut, don't scalp it. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll have players tee it up. I'll have them, I'll have them put it on a tee, tee it down pretty low. And then I'll say, okay, I want you to hit it as low as you can, don't take a dip. Because wedges are easy to hit high and they're hard to curve. Right? right. So if we can hit it, if we can hit a wedge really low and curve it a lot, then we can dial it back to just the right amount of curve. And I'm not talking about hitting hooks, but we want like a one or two yard draw is all. But a little bit of a little bit of curve, so when it hits, it goes right towards the hole. <clears throat> so those are some of the things that we teach, that, that, you know, to not dig, because if you dig, it's obviously not going to spin that much. <clears throat> so this is another thing right here. Here. This was another day. I want to show you the club face. So I don't know if you can see that, it's a little bit blurry. And you can see the ball marks are a touch higher because of the mat. But you want that ball mark on your wedge. When you, when you look at your, your student's wedges, and if you see ball marks on the toe of the club, then they're not going to be spinning that wedge, and they're almost always higher on the face. So getting, that, getting the, the ball marks in the center toward the heel of the club is going to maximize the spin on the golf ball. <clears throat> But a funny story about, about our wedge range is we have that record board like Sean was talking about. And uh, Molinari comes out to our wedge range. And he says, what's this? And I go, well, this is our wedge range. And these are our course records for the, and up there was Jonathan Berg. The pro was 38 shots. So taking 38 shots, they hit all eight blocks, which is, if you think about it, that's less than five balls a block. That's pretty young and good, right? So he goes, well, I'm going to try it. And I said, well, go ahead. You're not going to beat 38. So the first time he does it, he hits 38. I go, wow, that was pretty amazing. He goes, well, I do it again. I go, well, you only get one chance a day. 
And he goes, why do they never come back here again? So I want another chance. I said, okay, you aren't going to be 38, 33. So he, he's on our record board now, 33. And I have one junior that has the all-time record at 30 shots. But he's out there, you know, he practices all the time. So, but anyway, my first golf course that I put the wedge range was at first called Timaquan, and, and I, I fought for him for two years to do this. They go, the, 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 the owners, they go, this is, this is going to look terrible. These blocks out here, this is going to be, I said, so I finally went to him and I said, listen, here's the deal. You let me put that wedge range in, and we'll leave it in for one month. And if people don't like it and you think it looks so bad, then I'll take it out. I'll pay for it. I'm going to pay to put it in. I'm going to pay to take it out. I'll resolder it. He goes, really? Did you do that? I go, yeah. So we put it in. The first two days, the head pro became a hero. Everybody's like, man, that wedge range is the best thing in the world. And, you know, so I encourage you to, you know, if you want to do something like that, you, you, you know, it, it, people love it because it's kind of like trying to hit the, uh, you know, the picker or something. The picker goes by and they're trying to knock the guy out of the picker. But I mean, when you can hit the ball and the ball lands on the concrete and bounces straight up in the air and you go, oh yeah, you can have all kinds of, we have match play tournaments on the thing. There's all kinds of games that we play with it. So, and I built it. When I built it for Zach, the first time he came out there, I said, Zach, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to see how many balls it takes you to hit all the block. So he does it. It took him 168 shots to hit all the block. And he was so bad, and so he kept practicing, and then he got it down to 99, and then he got it down to 50, and then he won the Masters. And that year he won the Masters, he laid, as you might know, he laid up on every par five, and he buried 11 of the, of, of the 16 par fives, and he won. And ever since that time, he's kind of been known as a, you know, a great wedge player. But when I first told him about that, you know, hitting that low draw, he thought I was nuts and everything. Like a year later, he went, he, had, he went and had lunch with Tom Kite. And, and back in my day, Tom Kite was Mr. Wedge, right? He was, he was like really good with the wedge. And, and he came back from that lunch, and, and, he's, and he's shaking his head. Zach hates it on him, right? Competitive. That's how competitive he is. I said, what's the matter? He goes, I ate lunch with Tom Kite. I said, well, yeah, what did you talk about? He said, well, I asked Tom. He said, you know, what does it take to be a great wedge player? And Kai says, the first thing Kai says, if you want to be any good at all, your stock shot has to be a little draw. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, once he said that, you know, he, he believed me, right? He bought in, right? Third party verification. So, a few years, I won that teacher of the year thing for the PGA, and Tom Kai happened to be there. And so, I, I went up, and he came up, congratulated me, and I knew him from when I played on the PGA Tour a little bit, right? So. But anyway, I said, I told him, I said, hey, Tom, i got to tell you a funny story about Zach. So I told him the story about him, you know, how he came back after that lunch and everything. And, and I said, yeah, and he came back and you told him that the stock shot has to be a low draw with a wedge. And Kite looks at me and goes, Dun Irving on that? I mean, like, he didn't even think it was funny. He said, Dun Irving on that? And I go, well, I, I'm not really. I don't really know. So anyway, that was just common for him. <clears throat> How are we doing on time? We've got to do about 10, 15 minutes of questions. Okay. And then we'll show your exclusive video. Yeah, I have I got a tape that, that I gotta leave you with at the end of this thing. Speak so. up loud enough with the question we can hear you. We won't use the microphone. Question right there. What's the business of your uh pad? Thirty through hundred. So thirty, forty, fifty. Yeah, but I don't I would advise if you're going to do it, don't put them in a row. You want to sprinkle them around because that way the player has to change directions. They can't just sit there and hit to that one and go to that one and that kind of thing. And if you ever do that and you ever put it in, call me and I'll tell you all the games and things that we play with that. Okay? And I, I, I missed this earlier, but what we're going to send you or what um, Sean can send you is what's called the ball striking test. So you know how. Um, Hank talked about assessing. I don't know if you use the word assessment, but you gotta, you know, do a good job assessing your players. Well, the nice part of that's that ball striking thing with the zones, and you can do it very easily on your range with just cones if you want to set it up and do it with cones. But if you assess your students with like 10 nine irons, 10 sevens, 10 fives, hybrids, and driver, 
and then how, how many numbers they get in the zone and how much they miss right and left. It also has a place for right and left. And then it has a handicap. And so to be on the PGA Tour, you need to get 35 out of 50 or more in the zone. Okay, so it's pretty neat work. What's really good about it is I always tell people, don't worry about how many you get the first time. Let's worry about how many you get the next time we do it. And let's start practicing. There's two kinds of practice, right? There's, there's technical work, okay? So if I give a lesson and I want somebody to work on their technique and they're doing drills and they're doing some of the stuff I showed you and all that, but they've got to work on results too. If all they ever do is work on their golf swing and they go to the golf course, they're not going to play. Matter of fact, they're probably going to play worse. So I always try to get them to spend 50% of their practice time going through their routine and getting a shot to the target to the zone and get better at the zones. They hit groups of 10 so they can measure. So anyway, that's if you want that, um, you know, you, you can get it. I think an email to you. There's one in the back. Yeah, Mike. What do you do if the wear marks on someone's wedges are more out to the toe and low, even though they're they're fit, their clubs fit them lie angle wise on a board? It's usually, in my experience, they're usually tipping the club head out, or their hands and everything are getting closer to them, not the bottom of the swing. Because it's a radius, right? It's a radius. So if I'm hitting, if I set the club up in the center and I hit it on the toe, that radius is changing, right? So it could be the posture's changing. It could be the sequence of the downswing. There's several things that could create that. But normally, it's only, usually on the steeper side. And if they usually are coming a little bit more shallow and rotating, they usually, if anything, might hit more toward the heel, center toward the heel. But I have a thing right here that we use that's kind of fun. I get some pretty fun whole videos on this. But basically, what it is is called the chipping clip. And it basically goes six right on the face of the club. And you can create whatever size sweet spot you want. And so, you know, it starts to teach people how to get that thing hidden in the center there. If they don't, it kind of, you know, ricochets off to the left. Yeah. Do you use the hole that's in range? Do you use both sides? Meaning it's always a fade. Yes. This way, but do you use both sides? We do. We, we put those poles, those colored poles, um, we do it on both sides of it. We, we pick a center target, more center of the range. That way we have room on either side. And then and then we do it for fades or draws. And then sometimes you want to, sometimes I have people, hey, I want you to draw it into the left side. You know, or fade it into, you know, so they can do different things with that. Speaking of all these uh, teaching aids that you have, how do you encourage your students to not use it four times and go, yeah, it was great, there you go. Because I get you know, that a lot. You know what I do is, um, you get a lesson, right? And you introduce these training aids. And you show a before and after film, okay? And the student looks better, like significantly. And you say, okay, and then the guy leaves, right? And then he comes back two weeks later, whatever it is. And he's still got the same move, right? You go, okay, uh, Mr. Smith, you know, what did you do this last couple of weeks of practice? He goes, man, I went to the range three times, I played golf twice or three times, or whatever. I said, hey, did you ever did you ever do the drill? Did you use that tool? Mm, uh, I, I want to see if I could do it without it. And you know what I say? Congratulations. You just proved that your way doesn't work at all. I said, so I said, you can waste your time out here and just get exercise. Or you can use this tool and get really good. See, because people have to be educated. If people, they have no idea how hard it is to change a motor program in the brain. Once you have, you know, if you if you don't ride, if I like, if I haven't ridden a bike in 20 years, I can get right on a bike and ride right down the street because it's in there, right? It's in there. I haven't skied in 15 years, and when I'm skiing, my, my sister, who's an expert skier, said, man, it looks like you've been skiing every year. You know what I mean? So the thing about it is, is to change that motor program, that's why I think there needs to be more education on what it takes to make swing changes and what good lessons are. If the, if the consumers out there knew that, they would have a different attitude, I think. And they would stick with our programs longer and they would realize that that's just part of the process. 
But the good news is, this is what I always tell them, the good news is once you prove that, you got it. I mean, it's not like you're going to prove it and then you got it and then all of a sudden, two weeks later, it's going to be a bad, a different thing. You know what I mean? So that's why I think it's in some regards, it's really good that it's that hard to change. Okay? And I, without, Ledbetter said it years ago, I got it hanging in my cabinet. He said, anyone who thinks they can improve significantly without using some sort of training aid is in for a much longer fight. So training aids don't always have to be one of these things. I mean, a camera's a training aid, right? But I mean, you've got to have feedback. If you don't have feedback, and that's the feel versus real thing that we all know, right? The person, oh yeah, are you doing it? Oh yeah, I'm doing it great. And then they look on camera. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't even like to show them on camera because they, they don't look any different and they don't want them to get ejected, right? But, you know, so teaching them how to practice, using practice stations where they get feedback is vital. <coughs> Critical to, to really, if you're really, if you're going to really make a, a significant change that's going to last. And the great part about golf is we can play our whole lives. What the, the guy says, how long is this going to take? I said, what's your alternative? Right? I mean, keep doing it as you always do, and you're not going to go ship and putt, maybe you'll get better. So a lot of times it's going to take you two years, but during that process, you're, now you're a 15, and now you can go. Now you're unlimited on your potential. So you're going to be a single digit player, and you keep getting better. Would you take that? And they go, yeah. You know what I mean? So anyway, so we got to do a lot of time talking about stuff like that to people. So I noticed your wedge range is off mats. Well, the only reason that is is because we're space limited. Okay. Is and there? Downside to going off mats. What are like the positives and negatives of off mats? And do you tell your students to watch out for things when you're yeah. on mats versus the mats? Out? The mats, the, 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 the they're very consistent, obviously. But they're the problem with it is the ball launches higher, and um, you know it's not ideal, really. But I mean, you can still tell by the launch angle with the ropes and everything, and by the sound of the ball, things like that. So we tell them to work on it down there, but we, well, we have them, you know, obviously they go over to the grass in another area and they can practice out of there. It's just that the wedge blocks aren't set up. They can still hit to the blocks, but it's, it's just odd yardage and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Like this, there's causes, but 
that's a, that's something that I do when they hit that board. Uh, another thing that I do is take a shaft. I don't know if you can see this, but I'll stick it in the ground like this, where the tip is about it's about a foot high. I'll have them come underneath here until this touches in, in their golf posture. Then I'll have them back up about three fingers, take a step to the left. So now they're going to hit from here, and then I got the board right there. And so now if they come down on plane, the club shaft is coming right underneath, or the club head, I mean, it's coming right underneath. And so usually when they do that, and then that board is there, it won't work. Okay? But I'm sure there's lots of other ways too, yeah. Good one. Number one, and Hank touched on this too, you got to stick with what you're doing. Meaning, when you get a drill and the guy's floundering around or whatever, you know, get him to make some practice swings, hit teams out of the ground, get him. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up too early. Don't jump ship and say, hey, that drill's not working. So I would be more patient uh, for sure. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is that I think you have to know cause and effect. I mean, I think when people read video, they see a lot of the effect. They don't know what the cause is. And if you don't know what the cause is, and Hank, I think Hank said this too today, because I was just sitting there going, man, sounds like me, or what I'm going to talk about. But, but you know, if you don't know what the cause is, and you try to work on the effect, like if somebody's releasing the club early and you try to get them to hold the angle, that's not going to work. They're not, because it's not, well, it's not that they're casting the club, it's that they're, the way they're bringing the club down, the sequence of their swing is causing that. And that could be a bite, that could go all the way back to the line. It could go all the way back to the tilt. So you, you, if you know the order, then teaching becomes way easier, way easier to analyze and, and assess. <clears throat> so I don't know if that answers this. Okay, over here. What's the most important thing you learned from Mac O'Grady? How about 95% of everything I know? No, I think I think Mac O'Grady, he his his approach just made sense to me because he took physics and science as a as a background to explaining why you wanted to move this way. But what what Mac has, Mac has got tremendous and he, even Ledbetter said it years ago. Ledbetter goes, nobody knows more about the golf swing than Mac O'Grady, but that doesn't necessarily make him a great teacher. And so, like to me, Mac has phenomenal knowledge of the golf swing, um, but I'm not so sure. Like, if he had to teach a high handicap amateur, I don't think I, I'd love to see it. <laughs> I think that would be tough. <laughs> so all the drills and all the stuff that I that I have learned over the years and done, I mean, he didn't use any of that stuff, right? He, he was just here. You know, he would have us get on the range and he'd say, hey, the shaft was one inch above your humerus bone. You gotta lower that thing one inch. Okay, hit a ball. You know, and then he looked on the video and he didn't do it, he was mad at it, you know? So, I mean, so, but he, he, he his information, in my opinion, um, is why I have had the success I've had. Yeah, I would not be where I am today, more where I've had the success with Zach Johnson and a lot of these players that I've worked with, the wasn't for Matt. And he, he's mad at me, but he's funny. He's mad at everybody. <laughs> the original model, he's got three models. His original model, and if he was here, it's almost the same thing, it's still the best. Still, it was still the best. All the players that worked on it, they all, all their careers went like this. And the three models, now they're all over the place. So, anyway. Okay. All right. That's it. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I have to leave you though with this because we gotta have some fun here. It's not all serious stuff. Okay, so. So this is a tape that I show my tour players because I tell them if they don't start playing better, they're going to have to teach people like this. <laughs> so this guy came, it's very motivational. This guy came to me and said, hey, 
you know, I like to find out what they've been doing. He said, well, over the winter, I went down to Miami to a golf school. I said, which one did you go to? Uh, Jim McLean down there? He goes, no, I went to the Flamingo School of Golf. I go, I've never heard of that one, but being in Miami, you know, watch this swing. <laughs> there it is. Happy feet. This guy here, I was talking to him. I do golf schools in the summertime, go to private clubs and so forth to do schools, and we did this one, and I was talking to him. He goes, man, I knew the school was coming up. I've been working super hard on my flexibility for golf. Watch this right foot here. Ooh. That's a real leg, too. Ooh. This guy here, his name was Sam. I said, Sam, I want you to hit down to that pine tree. He goes, hey, Mike, don't call me Sam. He says, call me Look Away. I go, okay, Look Away, go ahead and get away. Watch his head here. <laughs> I told him, I said, Sam, I said, what's the deal? I said, you've got one white glove on and one black glove. What's the deal with that? He goes, hey, not everything black and white. <laughs> so I thought I'd have a little fun with him. So I got him in a review room or reviewing video. And I said, I paused him right there. I said, Sam, all you've got to do is turn your left toe up. You'd have a perfect left-handed finish. <laughs> 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 I said, I, I said, you do have an unusual swing. This is true story. I said, how did you play it? He goes, hey, I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I always was. <laughs> I go, that sounds like a song. I need to write that down. Look at that guy. Woo. This guy here, this is a training aid we used to use, and he's from Germany, and I don't know if any of you top players from Germany, but they are the most mechanically minded people. You know, some people have kind of like a, a checklist that they go off of. He's got like a check sheet, so watch this. So he demonstrates this really well. He's using this. So basically, that thing falls out of the way and everything. It, it works, you know, to help you with your takeaway. Pretty cool thing. So now I'm going to kind of speed this up because it takes him a while to get reset. So he's got everything all set. He's going through his check sheet, and right before he hits it, he's to, his last thing is to make sure his shoes are tied. Watch his, watch his head. He's going to look at his right foot. Yep. Got that? All right, ready to go. <laughs> you can say he lost his head over that one. And I did say they used to use that training. <laughs> this is a senior club champion out of Brookfield Country Club up in New York. Take a look. <laughs> I said I had to ask. I said, have you ever had any help before? She said, well, I took a lesson once. I said, well, what did they tell you to do? She said, they told me at the top of my swing I should point the club at the ball. And I said, are you sure they didn't say point the club at the target? She goes, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> What's this one here? <laughs> point the club at the ball. <laughs>
guy, this guy I was asking him how he found out about the school. He said, my brother Kyle Mazoot told me about it. I said, okay, let me watch you hit one. I go, yep, I remember your brother. <laughs> this guy in the distance here with that green cat, he's an ex-hockey player, so I was talking to him about hockey and I asked him about what he likes about it. You know, he liked checking guys into the board. He goes, no, I really love to score on a breakaway. I go, well, it's hard with a goal, you know, he's small area. He goes, the best place is to, is to score is the number five hole, right? You know what that is? Clean the legs, take a look here. He's going to hit, hit, score. <laughs> Now, you gotta, hey, I got to tell you about this shot. First, what happens is, is I turn around and go turn off the camera. Goes between and hit her legs, hits the shot, hits me on the shoulder. And watch what he does. I turn around and, and watch what he does right after he does it. He's going to bend down and he's going to take a long time seeing the ball. And no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Watch this shot. Watch what he does there. Look, he's looking down. Like, no, it wasn't me. Now, watch, watch, what, watch his expression when he gets up. <laughs> He's laughing. Okay, this is uh, this is a, a, a drill gone wrong. This guy saw me. I walked away to go do something. And he decided he would work on it anyway. So take a look here. Oh, oh. we gotta slow that down. Take a look here. He's gonna get a little steep, but look at that impact. <laughs> Oh. I said, well, the good news, I said, you have something in common with Mo Norman, because I was with him once, and he said he came so far from the inside, he hit himself with the right foot. Oh, wait oh. So this is, this, is, <laughs> this is a video I'm going to send to the PGA of what not to do. So my assistant, Matt, is is filming the boy, but what he's not paying attention to is the girl, and every shot she hits, she's turning, and she's turning, and so she's all teed up right now. This is her time, and who's got some of his training? Watch this. She's going to hit, game of inches, they call it. He takes it back. There's the ball. <laughs> Okay, last one. I'm doing 
wrote a summary at the end of the lesson. Well, there's a street right here, and the guy, the guy that I'm giving a lesson to is in the neighborhood, and he showed up late for his lesson. I said, Mike, sorry, I'm late for the lesson. And so I said, well, he goes, I was waiting on a furniture delivery. I said, well, did it ever show up? He goes, no, but I didn't want to miss my lesson. So watch this at the end of this thing. So it feels great. You can see how this knee is moving in. Okay. And then from there, right on around. Right on up. So do that drill with the shaft. Come down with just the shaft. Now listen. Come down with just the shaft. The truck, the furniture truck hits the branches on the trees and then proceeds to crash into the median. It's, cool. it's, just, it's, cool. it's better when it's louder. And I told the guy, I said, I think you better order a new, uh, <laughs> you better call for a new order. Do that drill with the shaft.